All right, welcome to the fifth and final episode from this series on Darwinian evolution. And in this episode, we're going to go over what is the evidence that backs up Darwin's theory of natural selection. And I first want to start off with the fossil record. The fossil record is not complete because it's, it's kind of hard for an organism to form a fossil, and then it's hard for us as human beings to find them. But there are a number of fossils out there that show what we would call a transitional species. Okay, Now, if you look over here on this picture of the horse, the oldest horse or the ancestor of the horse that showed up was about 60 million years ago. And it was a much smaller animal. Look, you're at 0.4 meters. Uh, so you're talking eh, not quite two feet tall. And you'll notice that it has one, two, three, four toes. And as we move up the line in horse evolution, we begin to lose toes. In fact, horses essentially only have one toe, and that would be the hoof. And as you can see, as they get bigger, or as they get uh, uh, closer to the modern horse, they increase in size and they lose toes. So we have a fossil record that shows the transition from the ancestor to the modern horse. Okay. Now in this picture down here, we show the transition of fossil nautiluses. Nautiluses are these kind of creatures down here, kind of squid-like, uh, live in a shell. And in the earliest ancestor, the shell is pretty much just an oval. And then the next species, it becomes really long. Um, think of like uh, the stick or a cone for cotton candy. And then we begin to see this stick begins to curl into a circle. And the, the adaptation for that is there's less things for a predator to grab. A predator could probably grab the tip of this pretty easy. And now with it all curled up, there's less for it to grab. And this here is essentially a modern Nautilus. So you'll notice they really haven't changed much for a few million years or so. All right, so the fossil record is very good. It shows us the transitions from early ancestors to the more modern individual. All right, similarities in anatomy. Uh, organisms who are closely related or species that are closely related are going to have similar anatomy. And as we can see down here, what we have here are the primates. And especially uh, comparing them with a human uh, skeleton. So you can see here, here's the human skeleton. This would be a gorilla, this is a chimpanzee, an orangutan, and a gibbon. And they look strikingly similar. In fact, you can see tons of human-like features in this. Now, the one thing you'll notice different is all of these animals are not quite totally bipedal. Uh, in fact, the chimpanzees, orangutans, and gorillas, they can walk upright for short periods of time um, but their knees are not constructed for walking upright. Uh, one of the things you'll see in a human, notice how our knees, they kind of bend in. They're designed to support all of our weight. These organisms, their arms are much longer, so the arm is going to support more of their weight because they're more or less tree dwellers. Okay. You'll also notice that the human brain cavity is much bigger than any of these other primates. And the primates have a much uh, tougher uh, vegetative diet, so that they have stronger ball, um, uh, jaw muscles, and they're going to have stronger jaw bones so that they can eat the thing. In fact, if you look right here on this gorilla, that ridge and that ridge, that's used as a attachment point for some very strong jaw muscles so that they can bite and crunch down on the vegetative matter that they eat. Okay? All right, so let's move that away. All right, now when we talk about similarities in anatomy, we want to really think about homologous structures. And I want you to remember that the prefix homo means the same. So when we talk about homologous structures, we're talking about features that came from the same embryonic tissue. So the only way that you could have a homologous structure with another species is you have to be related because the genes that make that are going to be found in both organisms. Now, this is created by a process called divergent evolution. So what we have here is we have a common ancestor, but then this species diverges off of it. And then we have another species that may diverge off of it. 
and another one that diverges off of them. So you could have example like there would be your human, there would be your whoops, there'd be your chimp, there'd be your gorilla, and there would be your orangutan. Where if you look at the similarities in anatomy that we had on the previous slide with their skeleton, uh, those are all homologous structures because the orangutan, the gorilla, the chimp, and the human are all going to share similar genes that created those homologous structures. So I want to hit that part again. Would you pay attention to this? Homologous structures have a very same structure anatomically, which implies they have to have the same type of genes that created those structures. And the only way two different species or two different organisms can have extremely similar or the same genes, they have to be related. Think of like in your own family, your, your siblings and your mother and father are going to have most of the genes uh, similar to you because you're most closely related to them. All right, so must be related. <clears throat> All right, so in this example of showing divergent evolution, we're looking at a monkey, a whale, a pig, and a bird. And these are all organisms that are chordates. In other words, they've got a backbone, they've got um, um, bones made out of calcium that's internal, etc. You know, the things that we would expect to see in an animal. More or, le more or lessly, they're, they got their vertebrates, okay? So if we look here in a human bone, there we've got your humerus, uh, your radius, your ulna, and then your hand and wrist bones. You look over here in the whale, humerus, um, radius, ulna, wrist bones, finger bones, Pig, humerus, ulna, or I'm sorry, radius, ulna, wrist bones, finger bones. And even in a bird, you know, which is kind of much more reptilian line, but they are a vertebrate, so they should be some homologous structures. You're going to see the same thing in here. A humerus, a radius, an ulna. The wrist bones have fused to come out longer so that you can have a longer wingspan, and you still have some remnants of some finger bones. So... This is much more reptilian, so it looks a lot different than these other more modern chord, or I'm sorry, uh, more mammalian organisms, all right? So we're seeing similarities in anatomy helping us show that we have homologous structures where we've diverged from uh, common ancestors. All right, now here we've got a lobed fin fish. Uh, they, they have these kind of, they call them lobes. They're, they're kind of much more fleshy, and they got bones in them. And as you can see here, this lobe fin fish, this is like a uh, humerus, radius, or you could look at this maybe as a shoulder blade, humerus. These right here would be the two forearm bones, and then you got wrist and fingers, uh, pelvis, femur, uh, tibia and fibia, and then your toe bones. Um, the evidence states that the first animal who walked upon land was an amphibian, and they evolved from a lobed fin fish. And as you can see here, there's your uh, shoulder blade, matches up with there. There's your humerus, matches up here. Those are your two forearm bones. And then here you've got your uh, wrist and fingers. See those down here? And the same way with down here at the back. That can evolve into a pelvis. This can eventually change into a femur. femur. And then you got your tibia and fibia. So you got pelvis, femur tibia and fibia, and then wrist and finger bones, okay? So these would be homologous structures. They come from the same genetic evolutionary line. All right, analogous structures. The ANA refers to something that means opposite or not the same. So these are similar structures, but they don't come from the same embryonic tissue. They're from convergent evolution. In other words, they've got two organisms, and they've converged to look similar. So they're not related. They're just converged to look similar. What causes this? They live in a similar habitat that has the same evolutionary pressures or what we would call selection pressures. Now, the best example of that would be sharks and dolphins. Okay, they both have a fish shape, okay, but this fish shape is because they live in water. So to have a fish shape, if you're a water dweller, 
gives you an evolutionary advantage, or let's say this, an adaptive advantage. So if you think of even like um, seals, they have kind of that torpedo, which is sort of a fish shape. So as we can see here, we've got tails, we've got fins, and we got pectoral fins, and we see the same thing on the dolphin, okay? Except this is a cartilaginous fish, you have a bunch of cartilage in here, and it doesn't quite look like humerus, radius, ulnus, and wrist bones, where if you look at the flipper of this dolphin, you, know, you can almost see that it could be you know, just like your arm. Now, I also want you to pay attention is that a shark is going to wave its fin back and forth, its tail back and forth as it swims. Whales and dolphins go up and down, up and down because that's how your legs and your pelvis works, okay? Our feet go like this, one, two, three, four, five, as we're stepping. So if I would just put you horizontal and put you in the water, your feet would go up and down. You notice like when you're in the pool and you kick, you're kicking up and down, up and down, up and down. And even when we do some of our swimming strokes where we replicate a dolphin, it's because we're designed like a dolphin, all right? So skeletal-wise, this dolphin, being a mammal, is much closer to us than a fish, okay? But because they live in the same environment, evolution or natural selection has determined that a fish-like shape gives you an adaptation. So these mammals who had this shape, they can outcompete and they pass their genes on to the next generation. All right. Now, vestigial organs are another structure that can give you a hint to what the uh, common ancestor was like. So vestigial structures, there are homologous structures. In other words, they came from the same embryonic tissue. So the genetic reasons of why they came about are the same. It's an implication that you are uh, a relative. But a vestigial structure is very small and unused. And it's a huge hint at what the common ancestor was like. All right, so let me clear that, and I'm going to show you a picture of it. <clears throat> Okay, in this picture we have a whale, all right? <clears throat> and you'll notice in this whale, even though it doesn't have like back flippers, it has what is called a vestigial pelvis. So as you can see here, this would be like a pelvis bone, and this would be a vestigial leg bone, all right? So these are an evolutionary leftover is a great way to think of a vestigial structure. Uh, think of like in the human body, you have an appendix. An appendix is an evolutionary leftover from when we had a, uh, an ape-like um, common ancestor that had basically a second stomach chamber. We don't use that anymore, but the appendix is a vestigial leftover from that evolutionary line. Okay, in this next picture, we're going to show you a snake, all right? Some snakes are going to have a vestigial femur and pelvis back here when because it's a a hint to the time when an ancestor of theirs had legs. So as you can see, they have a very small femur right here, and the pelvis leftover bone is a little bit bigger. All right, so it's a vestigial. It's an evolutionary leftover, and it gives you a hint at what the common ancestor was like. <clears throat> All right, so now we're getting deeper into the genetic reasons that show you an evolutionary relationship or how two species are related. And it comes with sim similarities in embryonic development. Now, embryonic development is pretty much controlled by a series of genes called Hox genes. Okay, So these are genes that control uh, embryonic development. So let me get myself caught up here. Okay, we had a previous chapter where we, we told you just a little bit about these, but not a ton of detail. All right, so as you can see here, up here at the top, we're very, very early in the development of this organism. And you're going to notice that because these guys are all vertebrates, I mean, fish have a backbone, rabbits have a backbone, and a gorilla has a backbone, they are, they are related, so we should see some similarities in their basic gene function. So as you can see here, the fish, the rabbit, and the gorilla, you can't really tell a ton of difference. But if you look real close, you can't really tell the difference at this stage of embryonic development between a rabbit and a gorilla because they're both mammals. 
you can certainly tell that these two are more closely related, and this organism is not as closely related, but it is related nonetheless, because you can see they're nearly identical. Okay, so now in the second row, <clears throat> we're starting to see that this is definitely going to be a fish. Here, can't quite tell what type of organism it's going to be. They're both mammals. They're much more closely related. It's not until you get into this third row that you can start to see that these two organisms are not the same. In fact, I think this rabbit looks more like a goat or a sheep or something, and you can clearly tell that this is going to be a monkey or ape of some sort. And now you can clearly tell that this is a fish. Okay, So by looking at these three um, diagrams, you can tell that the two mammals are much more closely related, probably had a much more recent common ancestor, and the fish diverged off the vertebrate line much, much longer ago. And finally, I've saved the best piece of evidence for evolution by natural selection for last. Okay, When you can compare the DNA and the amino acid sequence of various proteins for different species, that is a perfect way to judge how closely related they are. Because as I told you earlier in the screencast, the genes between individuals, like in human beings, you're going to have more similarities with your immediate family because that's where you've inherited your genes. So the implication is if species A and species B have this, a huge similarity in genetic makeup, then they have to be related. Okay, so I want you to pay attention to this guy. Whoops, let's go with this color. Let's go with blue. Okay, this stuff in red is real important. So make sure you commit this to memory. The more similarities in DNA, you have to be close related, which means that you or diverged much more recently from a common ancestor. That could be 500,000 years ago, or it could be 10,000 years ago. It's all relative to how long and old the Earth has been. Fewer similarities, the less likely related, which means you diverged from the common ancestor longer ago or much more farther in the past. So uh, maybe you diverged 100,000 years ago and not 50,000 years ago or 5 million years ago instead of 1 million years ago. That's going to be enough time to show you the differences. Okay, I want you to focus over here on this picture. Okay, this is a karyotype that is comparing the chromosomes from a human being to a chimpanzee. The chimpanzees are our closest living relatives, which means the common ancestor for us was probably very chimp-like because the DNA of chimps and humans is 98.4% identical. In other words, the A's and T's and C's and G's of a human and a chimpanzee are exactly the same in the correct order 98.4% of the time. All right, so uh, the chromosome with an H above it is a human, and the chromosome with the C above it comes from a chimp. Now, chimpanzees have 48 chromosomes, where humans only have 46. And it's because the human chromosome number two in a chimpanzee has basically been chopped into another one, so it's been split. So this is where the extra two come from. Now, some of these similarities are incredibly stunning. I want you to look at the X chromosome. Notice that in the human and the chimp, they're almost practically identical. Chromosome number seven is almost practically identical. Number six, there isn't much difference. And if you come down here to 15 is almost the same. And let's see if there's any more in here that are pretty similar. 11, pretty close to the same. Okay. The Y chromosome in a human just happens to be longer but the banding patterns are almost the same, okay? Huge similarity between humans and chimps, which strongly implicates that we have diverged from a common ancestor recently, okay? It also shows you the power of mutation and changes. That 1.6%, that's enough to make humans vastly more intelligent, uh, to walk upright, to have better motor skills, fine motor skills with their fingers. It's just enough to send us on a totally different evolutionary past. Okay, This is going to wrap up this series on evolution. This is one of my favorite topics. We're going to have a second series of evolution called, surprisingly, Evolution 2, where we're going to look at more of the genetics behind 
evolution. And it's also one of my favorite chapters. So out of all the video series that I made, we're now in some of, the, some of my favorites. So until our next series, we're going to catch you on that flip side.